the territories occupied by the Western Allies, the economic system that was inherited from the Nazi regime, uh, a command war economy was initially retained. Uh, that meant practically all consumer goods were rationed. All around price controls and wage controls remained in effect and imports and exports were strictly regulated by the military administration. Black markets and barter trade were all over the place. As a consequence of an excess supply of paper marks, uh, estimated at 300 billion, uh, which could not find anything to buy because of uh, general, general price numbers, uh, price controls, price max maxima, uh, and because of that was useless, black market prices experienced a highly inflationary development and substitute currencies like coffee, cigarettes, and butter emerged. Uh, German output in 1946 was less than one third of that of 1938. Chaos and desperation characterized the general situation. In 1947, in, re in response to the beginning of the Cold War between the Western Allies, in particular the US on the one hand and the Soviet Union on the other hand, the Western powers changed their policy toward Germany. While their previous goal had been the deindustrialization of Germany, uh, the Industrial production was supposed to be frozen at 50 to 55 percent of Germany's 1938 output level so as to permanently impoverish the German population. It was then in 1947 decided to uh, change the policy and to uh, start an economic reconstruction period uh, in order to build up the German economy to uh, as a power base for the new strategy of containment and rollback. From 1948 to, through 1952, the three western zones, uh, what later became West Germany, received uh, $1.5 billion in martial aid. But much more important than this, in May of 47, the British and American occupied zones were merged. Uh, the economic administration of the unified region was largely put back into German hands. And in March 48, Ludwig Erhard, uh, who was formerly economics minister of Bavaria, was elected as the director of this new buy zone. Uh, Erhard, whose economic thinking had been heavily influenced by the neoliberal Freiburg school of Walter Eugen and Franz Böhm, which had in turn been influenced by the Austrian school and Ludwig von Mises in particular, Erhard initiated a currency reform in 1948 and consequently pursued a comparatively successful hard money policy, which resulted in Germany becoming quickly uh, one of the world's least inflationary countries and the Deutsche Mark uh, becoming one of the hardest currencies. Give you an indication, during the 13-year period from 1948 to 1961, the consumer price index rose by a mere 14 percent. This is less, uh, roughly an increase of 1 percent per year. Uh, more importantly, Contrary to the advice of American and British economic experts, um, and also against the prevailing public opinion in Germany, only four days after the currency reform, uh, in June of 48, Ludwig Erhard implemented a radical, also by no means exceptionless, free market reform. In accordance with the precepts of the new Keynesian economics and the practice of the ruling British Labour Party, the foreign experts and the German public opinion had favored a policy of macroeconomic management, of socialized investment, and a sector of nationalized basic industries. Instead, Erhard abolished 
almost all price and wage controls in one stroke allowed almost complete freedom of trade, movement and occupation and thereby radically increased and expanded the rights of private property owners. Less than a year later, in May of 49, the Federal Republic of Germany was founded and the framework of the so-called social market economy that was created by Erhard became ratified as West Germany's new economic constitution. Uh, from the outset, the development in the Soviet-occupied territories of Germany, what later became East Germany, took a very different course. Already in 1945, in its very first order, the Soviet military administration nationalized all banks. Still in the same year, all farms of more than 250 acres were expropriated that amounted to 50% of all agriculturally used land. And all property of actual or alleged Nazi or at war criminals was confiscated. In November of 49, a few months after the Western Allies had licensed the new West German government, uh, the Soviets licensed uh, East German, the East German government, and elevated the principle of expropriation uh, to a constitutional principle. Uh, in the German Democratic Republic, one paragraph in the Constitution says, the economy of the German Democratic Republic is a planned socialist economy. By 1960, more than 90% of all agriculturally used land was in the hands of socialized producer co-ops. In 1950 already, more than 60% of all productive output was produced in socialized firms. In 1960, uh, this, uh, side that the share was 80%. In the early 70s, the expansion of the socialized sector had reached 95%. That is, only 5% of productive output was still produced in state licensed private enterprises. In addition, from 1945 through 53, that is during the Stalin era, East Germany was forced to pay heavy reparations. 45% uh, of the productive equipment of 1945 was dismantled and confiscated by the Russians uh, as compared with only 8% in the West. Uh, to facilitate centralized economic planning, a one-stage central banking system was set up. Uh, the central bank became at the same time the monopolistic note issuer and also the central commercial bank with all the regional and local banks being essentially branches of the, uh, of the central bank. Um, three days after the West German currency reform uh, in June of 1948, uh, a new East German uh, currency with an officially fixed one-to-one -one exchange rate against West Germany's Westmark was introduced. Uh, however, a continuing policy of monetary expansion combined with price maxima for all basic consumer goods led again quickly back to the phenomenon of repressed inflation, that is an excess supply of anesthetized money. Uh, in response, in 1957, a second currency reform had to be carried out all banknotes in excess of 300 East Marks were declared invalid. But again, of no avail, because the excess supply of money against the swell well to some presently estimated 150 billion Marks, which is about 10,000 Marks per person in East Germany. The steady supply of useless money entered the black private markets where prices drastically increased and the East German currency continuously depreciated against the West Mark. Increasingly, the West Mark outcompeted the East Mark as a medium of exchange on the black market, according to the rule that good money drives out bad money, 
and soon became East Germany's second unofficial but only real currency. So from 1949 on, when the Federal Republic of Germany and the German Democratic Republic were founded, uh, some sort of social experiment was conducted. A homogeneous population with very much the same history, culture, character structure, work ethic, and above all, the same language, was subject to two fundamentally different economic constitutions and institutional incentive structures. The difference in the results has been impressive, but no social experiment was needed to find this out. If one only would have familiarized oneself with the principles of economic theory, and in particular the theoretical economic analyses of socialism by the Viennese or Austrian school, and most notably by Ludwig von Mises' famous Die Gemeinwirtschaft, or in English, Socialism, uh, of 1922, one could have predicted all the things that uh, turned out to happen. Mises had in his book irrefutably demonstrated what the East Germans were now forced out to find out the hard way, that socialism must end in disaster. Now I come to the theoretical explanation why, why that must be. Wealth can be brought into existence or increased in three and only three ways. By, first, by perceiving certain nature-given things as scarce and actively bringing these things into one's possession before anyone else does. And the, this principle is called the homesteading principle. The second way of producing wealth is by producing goods with the, helps of one, with the help of one's labor and such previously homesteaded resources. And the third way is by acquiring goods through voluntary contractual transfer from a previous appropriator or producer. Acts of original appropriation or homesteading turn something which no one had previously perceived as a possible source of income into an income-providing asset. Acts of production are by their very nature aimed at the transformation of a less valuable asset into a more valuable one. And every contractual exchange concerns the change and redirection of specific assets from the hands of those who value their possession less to those who value them more. From this, it follows that socialism cannot but lead to, uh, lead to impoverishment. The first reason for this is, under socialism, ownership of productive assets is assigned to a collective of individuals regardless of each member's prior actions or inactions in relation to the owned asset. In effect, then, socialist ownership favors the non-homesteader, the non-producer, and the non-contractor, and, and, and disadvantages homesteaders, producers, and contractors. Accordingly, there will then be less original appropriation of natural resources whose scarcity is realized. There will be less production of new and less upkeep of old factors of production, and there will be less contracting. Because all of these activities obviously involve costs, and under a regime of collective ownership, the cost of performing these activities is raised, and the cost of not performing them is lowered. The second reason why socialism must fail is, means of production cannot be sold under socialism. And once means of production cannot be sold, then no market prices for factors of production exist. Without such prices, however, cost accounting becomes impossible. Inputs cannot be compared with outputs. And it is impossible to decide then if the usage of inputs for a given purpose has been worthwhile or instead has led to a squandering of scarce resources in the pursuit of projects with relatively little or no importance for consumers. 
in not being permitted to take any offers from private individuals who might see an alternative way of using some given means of production, the socialist users of resources simply do not know what they are missing, what the foregone opportunities are. And accordingly, permanent misallocations of factors of production will result. Third, even given some initial allocation of factors of production, because input factors and output, the output produced, are owned collectively, Every single producer's incentive to increase the quantity or the quality of his individual output is systematically diminished, and likewise is his incentive reduced to use input factors so as to avoid their over- or underutilization. Rather, with gains and losses in the socialist firm's capital and sales account socialized instead of attributed to specific individual producers, everyone's inclination towards laziness and negligence is systematically encouraged and hence, as a result, an inferior quality and or quantity of every single produce will occur and permanent capital consumption must result. The fourth reason, under a regime of private property, the person who owns a resource can independently of others determine what is done with it and what is not done with it. And if he wants to increase his wealth or rise in social status, he can only do so by better serving the most urgent wants of voluntary consumers through the use that he makes of his property. With collectively owned factors of production, however, collective decision-making mechanisms are required. Every decision as to what, how, and for whom to produce, how much to pay or charge to who, and who to promote or who to demote, it becomes a political affair. Any disagreement among individuals must be settled by superimposing on one person's will uh, the will of another one. And invariably, winners and losers must be created. Hence, if one wants to rise under socialism, one must resort to one's political talents. It is not the ability to initiate, to work, and to respond to the needs of consumers that assures success, rather it is by means of persuasion, demagoguery and intrigue through promises, bribes and threats that one must rise to the top under socialism. And needless to say that this politicalization of society implied in any system of collectivized ownership must contribute still more to impoverishment. Now, the German experiment provides a sad illustration for the truths of economic theory. Erhard's free market reforms quickly generated what has become known as the West German Wirtschaftswunder, or the economic miracle. After a short and unsurprising increase of unemployment, immediately after the reforms, that peaked at the rate of 8% in 1950. Employment then began steadily to increase. By 1962, at the height of the Erhard era, the unemployment rate had fallen to 0.2% and the number of employed persons had increased by some 8 million, that is by more than 60%. The total wage sum had tripled during the period from 1948 to 1960. The wage rates more than doubled in constant terms. In the same time, total industrial production increased fourfold, GNP per capita tripled, and the West German rate of economic growth far surpassed that of all Western European nations and also that of the United States. 
By the early 1960s, the West Germans ranked among the world's most prosperous people. And West Germany had become one of the foremost industrial nations with products made in West Germany worldwide increasingly in demand. In 1960, West German exports made up 10% of world exports. That was nearly twice the share of Germany in 1937. Predictably, the economic development in East Germany took the opposite direction. After 40 years of West German social market economy versus East German socialism, the visitor going from west to east enters an almost completely different and impoverished world. Life in East Germany is characterized by permanent shortages of all sorts of consumer goods, from meat to housing, endless, endless mismatches of complementary factors of production, an inferior and an shoddy quality of everything produced and a pervasive underground economy struggling to alleviate the mess created by the official one. Indicators of misallocation and capital consumption are omnipresent. Insufficiently maintained, deteriorating, unrepaired, rusting, even simply vandalized production factors, machinery, and buildings are rampant. Within the official economy, negligence, Laziness, despair, cynicism, and sheer incompetence abound. And there exists widespread hidden unemployment. Environmental damage has at many places reached catastrophic dimensions. That is the result of the socialization of negative externalities. Economic illiteracy among the population is pervasive. In world export markets, East Germany is reduced to the rank of a third world nation. Uh, they basically ex export only raw materials, half-finished products, and very simple type consumer goods. In the mid-50s already, the East German per capita consumption lagged an estimated 40% behind West Germany's. In the late 80s, it is now, Average wage income in East Germany is less than half of that in West Germany if the official East German currency exchange rate is assumed. And less than one-tenth of what it is in West Germany if, more realistically, the black market exchange rate between East and West German currency is used. In fact, the average wage income in East Germany is somewhat lower at the official exchange rate uh, or at the unofficial black market rate, five times lower than the typical unemployment subsidy in West Germany. Uh, average old age pensions in East Germany are three, or again at the black market rate, 15 times lower than in West Germany. And East Germany's minimum welfare handouts are nearly 50% or, again, seven times less than those paid in, in the West. However, most revealing is the voting by feet statistics. With all socialist, but while all socialist countries of Eastern Europe have been plagued by the immigration problem of people wanting to leave for the more prosperous West, and while they all gradually have to establish tighter border controls in order to prevent this outflow, the case of Germany is the most striking one. With language differences, which are traditionally the most severe natural barrier for immigrants non-existent, and West Germany automatically granting citizenship to all East German immigrants, the difference in living standards between the two Germanys proved to be so great that East Germany, from its very inception, con was confronted with a massive wave of emigration. <coughs> Following the industrial revolts in East Germany of 1953 and their suppression by the occupying Soviet military forces, emigration reached such proportions uh, by the early 60s, some 3.5 million people had left East Germany, that in August 1961, 
The socialist regime in East Germany desperately had to close its borders to the West completely. To keep its population in, it had to build a system of the likes of which the, the world had never seen before, of barbed wire, electrified fences, minefields, automatic shooting devices, watchtowers, almost 900 miles long, for the sole purpose of preventing the East Germans from running away from socialism. From 1961, after building the war, to 1989, the problem could be contained. However, beginning in the summer of 1989, when socialist Hungary began to open its borders to Austria, and still more since the dismantling of the East German Wall in November of 1989, the wave of East German immigration immediately resumed and even intensified. Since then, each day, more than 2,000 East Germans have packed and left socialism behind. Now, while the underlying cause for the collapse of the East German socialist experiment in 1989 was an economic one, there can be little doubt that Gorbachev's policy of glasnost and perestroika in the Soviet Union since the mid-80s was a catalyst for the revolutionary developments presently taking place in East Germany and all across Eastern Europe. Uh, it reduced the, uh, the pressure on, uh, Soviet, on the Soviet Union's East, German, uh, East European satellite states, especially since from the outset Gorbachev's new internal policies had been explicitly connected to a non-interventionist foreign policy and at the same time, it dramatically uplifted the hopes and expectations of all East European people. Outside of this spe special con constellation of data that was created by Gorbachev, neither the peaceful anti-communist revolution in Poland nor the liberalization of Hungary would have been possible. And without the Polish and Hungarian events, neither the East German nor the Czechoslovakian revolution would have followed. Gorbachev then ultimately must also be credited for the currently proceeding reunification of East and West Germany, which began on the forever memorable November 9th, 1989, when the East German socialist bubble exploded from steadily increasing pressures of mass emigration and civil unrest and the borders to West Berlin and East Ger West Germany had to be thrown open uh, and the East Germans and West Germans re reunited uh, on top of the Berlin Wall. From that day on there was no longer any question of two separate German states. Public opinion in East and West overwhelmingly supported reunification. And this support also became formally ratified through the outcome of East Germany's first multi-party elections in March of 1990. The economic dynamic set in motion by the events of November 9th did the rest to bury any remaining hopes within the East German regime of somehow restoring a separate socialist East German state. The uninterrupted mass flight of mostly highly qualified personnel and unceasing internal unrest sharply aggravated East Germany's already desperate economic situation. Within a few days, the East German mark had depreciated against the West mark from a ratio of 5 to 1 to 10 to 1. And only two reasons prevented its becoming completely worthless. For one thing, with largely open borders now, for a short period of time, holders of Ostmark could buy a number of maximum price control products in East Germany and profitably resell them in the West. Once the already sparsely decorated East German shelves were emptied this way, and increasingly less or no new supplies were forthcoming, only one other reason remained. That is, the public expectation 
that within the inevitable process of, re, of German reunification, the West German Central Bank would eventually redeem Ostmarks at some arbitrarily overvalued rate into Westmarks. Different but related economic problems emerged in West Germany. While the West German economy successfully integrated millions of East German refugees, and after 1961, millions of Southern European guest workers during the 1950s and 1960s, the economy of the 1980s showed great, great difficulties handling the latest and current inflow of immigration. From 1950 to until the 1980s, the West German economy had experienced a gradual but wholesome transformation. Over time, Erhard's free market Germany had changed into a gigantic welfare state and the early West German economic expansionism had been replaced by economic stagnation. From the outset, Erhard's free market reforms had been far from immaculate. He had not introduced a market economy, but a social market economy. And theoretical observers such as Mises had early on warned, and prophetically as it turned out, that this concession to a social economy would ultimately have to lead to welfare, welfare state socialism. As the successor of the German Reich, the West German state immediately became West Germany's biggest real estate owner, biggest capitalist and biggest employer. Education, traffic and communication, schools, universities, streets, rivers, lakes, railroads, airlines, mail, telephone, radio, and TV were all in government hands and were soon complemented by a newly founded West German draft army. All banks were cartelized within a government-controlled central banking system. Bismarck's compulsory social security system remained in effect and under government control. Housing and agriculture were largely left outside of and protected from markets. Special government protection was accorded to mining, coal, steel, shipbuilding, and textiles, among very many other things. Beginning with the so-called co-determination law of 1951 and the commercial constitution law of 1952, a series of so-called labor protection laws were introduced including subsidies to unemployment and compulsory collective bargaining, which increasingly limited the right of freedom of contract in employer-employee relations. With the deceivingly so-called law against restrictions of competition or antitrust law of 1957, the basic principle of free market competition, that is, of free and unrestricted entry, became largely sub suspended and all significant economic developments were made subject to government approval. All the while, at no time, even under Erhard, uh, could the West German government resist the temptation of steadily increasing taxes and increasing the supply of paper money. As a consequence, in 1966, West Germany experienced its first major recession, putting an end to Erhard's career, who by then had become Chancellor of West Germany. Economic growth fell from 9% in 1960 to 2% in uh, 1966 and was negative in 1967. For the first time in over a decade, the number of unemployed rose to 2%, I should mention, uh, but that was nonetheless a major crisis at that time. Uh, in the post Erhard era, in particular during the period from 1969 to 1982, under the reign of a social democratically led government, socialist liberal government coalition under Chancellor Brandt and Helmut Schmidt, uh, 
the welfare status transformation of the West German economy proceeded at an accelerated rate. From 1969 to 1975 alone, some 140 laws were passed that entitled various socially disadvantaged groups to tax subsidies. The so-called labor protection and antitrust laws were drastically stiffened. Taxes and social security contributions were significantly increased so as to finance the provision of all sorts of so-called public goods and enhance the quality of life. By resorting to a Keynesian policy of deficit spending, as I mentioned, the deficit rose from $57 billion, 57 billion marks in 1970 to $200 32 billion in 1980 and then to 503 billion in 1989. Uh, this Keynesian uh, policy of deficit spending um, and uh, initially by the market unanticipated inflationing, uh, the model of uh, then Chancellor Helmut Schmidt was rather 5% inflation than 5% employment. This policy could delay the economic consequences of these policies for a few years, only to show up later with a vengeance. Unanticipated inflation and credit expansion had created and prolonged the overall rather malinvestment typical of a boom. Yet this boom, built on nothing but paper money, inevitably had to be followed by a liquidation crisis, that is, a recession. In fact, not only was there soon much more than 5% inflation, unemployment also rose steadily, and both rates, the unemployment rate and the inflation rate, approached 10% simultaneously. Economic growth became slower and slower in the early 80s, and in the early 80s, GNP fell in absolute terms. For the first time in West German history, the number of employed people actually decreased. More and more pressure was put on foreign <coughs> workers to leave the country, and immigration barriers were raised to ever higher levels. Since 1982, when the socialist liberal government and left-wing Keynesianism was ousted and replaced by a conservative liberal government and right-wing Keynesianism, West Germany has proceeded on its march towards the welfare state towards the welfare state, if only at a somewhat slower rate. Government expenditures and government debts have continued to increase. The inflation rate has been relatively lower and the rate of economic growth has been relatively raised, but neither rate has fallen or risen to levels anywhere near those which have been characteristic of the Earhart era. And after eight years of conservative liberal rule, the number of unemployed, which had reached 2.3 million in 1983, is still above 2 million, that is nearly 8%. In this situation, the arrival of large numbers of East German immigrants who are at once eligible for West German welfare handouts and unemployment subsidies quickly began to expose not merely the bankruptcy of socialism, but also the bankruptcy of the West German welfare state. The threat then of East Germany's political instability spilling over to West Germany forced the West German political power elite to act quickly and to take the initiative in the inevitable process of reunification. However, Contrary to the situation in the late 40s, when Earhart had solved a similar crisis in German history by adopting an unpopular yet immediately highly successful strategy of free market crisis management, today, 40 years later, the course pursued and the solution sought by West Germany's political establishment is yet another step in the direction towards welfare socialism and is thus bound to further aggravate, aggravate West Germany's economic stagnation. 
Notwithstanding the popularity of the presently pursued policies among the Western East German public, instead of seeking the German reunification through a quick and radical desocialization of East Germany, and indirectly also West Germany, that alone would be in accordance with fundamental principles of justice and sound economics, and I will explain the strategy in a few minutes, uh, West Germany's political power elite, and in particular the incumbent government coalition, is seeking, and that becomes increasingly obvious, the reunification through a quick and complete incorporation of East Germany into the West German welfare state. The process of the takeover uh, is roughly like this. The West German parties, who are largely in control of the West German government uh, and are state financed, all their campaign costs get, uh, get paid by taxes and they get paid for every vote that they uh, receive in elections. The West German parties established immediately after the events in, of November uh, they are present in East Germany. Uh, and their propaganda line has been uh, that East Germany was suffering not from socialism, or not at least mainly from socialism, but from the fact that there was no democracy in East Germany and they would bring democracy to East Germany. So the, East, the West German parties established their presence there. They are were welcomed by the East German population. Uh, the election uh, that took place in March of 1990 was essentially bought by the West German parties through the promise of exchanging East German currency at a rate of 1 to 1 or 1 to 2 against East German marks, uh, which immediately makes, made the East German mark right uh, rise to an exchange rate of 4 to 1. Remember, immediately after the breakdown of the wall, it had fallen to 10 to 1. Um, the fact that this promise was made uh, explains also why the Conservative Party in West Germany uh, turned out to be the winner of the East German election. The East German population realized quite quickly that if they would get this exchange rate, uh, they would have to cater to the incumbent government. Uh, they were in power, they had the money, and they promised the quickest integration, uh, including all welfare payments to the East German public. Actually, the East German population is uh, social democratic in its uh, general attitude. They want to have a big welfare state, so the fact that the conservatives won should not uh, be taken as an indicator that there is not uh, welfare state mentality around in East Germany. Uh, now, what are the next steps that will take place? Uh, largely, the next steps are already clear. There will be a currency reform somewhere between an exchange rate of 1 to 1 uh, or 2 to 1. The effects of this currency reform will be a double redistribution of income. First, a redistribution of income within West Germany from the population to the government. The government simply prints up the money and robs the West German population of purchasing power. And secondly, of course, the redistribution of income from west to east. The consequence will be general inflation, at least in relative terms. It is not clear that, uh, that in absolute terms inflation must not necessarily result, since there are, of course, a, a, a number of goods that will be entering now the, the West German markets uh, as well. Uh, Inflation, in any case, will result, especially in light of the fact that there is a huge excess supply of money in East Germany. 
per person 10,000 10, uh, marks of unusable East German, uh, East German money. Um, also, this currency reform offers, of course, great opportunities for politically connected individuals for, uh, for speculative uh, for a speculative bonanza. The next thing that will happen is the government will sell assets uh, as if it owned them. There will be a few exceptions to this. Some former West German owners will have to be compensated. And some property will go directly to East Germans without these, these Germans having to pay for it. But in any case, some assets will be sold by the government, and hence the government, the newly established government, uh, will profit. And the East German population, by having to pay for these things, will lose. Allegedly, the receipts from the sale of the assets uh, will go to welfare payments but I will explain quickly that that will hardly do. Uh, further, government-connected buyers will be given preference when it comes to the sale of assets. Uh, and since now the East German government is nothing like the junior partner, junior partner, so in this case we would have an interesting redistribution of income from East to West. As West, some major West German firms profit at the expense of the East German population. The overall effect will be that there will, in East Germany, after the desocialization that will undoubtedly take place, there will still be more government property in East Germany than there is government property at the present moment in West Germany. The size of the total government sector in all of Germany will be higher than the government sector was prior to the reunification in West Germany alone. The consequence will be that while there will be improvement in East Germany as compared to what was in existence before, due to the, and, and this improvement will of course occur because of the limited privatization that occurred. The situation in West Germany will relatively worsen. The East German mess is obviously still around. With all welfare payments and collective bargaining results available now in East Germany as well, permanent transfer payments are necessary. Permanent subsidies from West to East, which means higher taxes in the West, but also within the East, from those people who are productive individuals in the East to those people who are unproductive in the East. So of course that means taxes in the East. In sum, the stagnation problem that exists at the present moment in West Germany, yes, two million, more than two million unemployed, the stagnation problem in West Germany will reappear and will be even stronger for all of Germany than it is in West Germany alone at the present moment. And this situation then gives rise to the danger of increased nationalism and increased attempts to throw foreigners out of the countries because allegedly they take jobs away from Germans. Now what is the alternative? to this course that the government is presently pursuing. The alternative is to achieve the German reunification through desocialization and free trade. What should be the principles of, uh, of the de desocialization and reunification? The principles should be, first, it is not West Germany's fault that East Germany is poor. Therefore, there should be no redistribution policy. There should be no currency reform of the type that is presently inaugurated. But 
There should be an exchange of currencies at market rates. There should also be no wholesale incorporation of East Germany into West Germany. East Germany rather must do it alone in a just and economically efficient way. And that can be done. How? The economic problem is obviously collective ownership. And then the solution must be privatization. And not, of course, democratization. Privatization is the key. How to privatize? The first consideration is the former East German government is now recognized by everyone as illegitimate. And so then is all the property that they acquired illegitimately acquired property. The new government was brought about by free elections could not possibly be thought of as a government that now has a legitimate title to these, to these assets. The old government was a criminal gang. Uh, if they are a criminal gang and acquire the property in criminal ways, then the new government even though it might be freely elected, cannot become the legitimate owner of these assets all of a sudden. The property must revert first to the people, and fully and completely. And above all, the people should not have to pay the government to get their property back, because the government never legitimately owns these assets. What should be done then is, all old property titles should be immediately recognized. There are tens of thousands of people, tens of thousands of people in West Germany who have legitimate title to property in East Germany, and there are about tens of thousands of people in East Germany who also hold legitimate titles to uh, property in East Germany. Otherwise, if there is no prior or no previous owner, previous owner cannot be found. Otherwise, all productive assets should go to the producers who use these assets at the present moment. According to the slogan, the farmers should go to the farms, should go to the farmers, the factory factories should go to the factory workers, uh, the streets could, should go to the street workers, the bureaus should go to the bureaucrats. The property shares should be freely tradable. The people get property shares in these things, and uh, the property shares should be immediately tradab tradable, and the stock market should be established. People should have the right to sell their assets immediately. Nothing, no assets should be left in government hands. There are two seeming problems about this, this strategy. First, there's a problem that you might have a landowner who claims the land back, but in the meantime, on the land, some new structures were erected. And the new structure, of course, cannot possibly be owned by the landowner, but must be owned by somebody else. Now, since you cannot separate the structures from the land, uh, the landowners and the structure owners then must bargain. Uh, First, I thought that was a major problem, but uh, I came to realize that it isn't really a problem at all. Because in any case, there are always only two parties involved, and there is only a limited amount of resources involved. And furthermore, uh, both are forced to find, uh, to find a solution to their bargaining problem quickly, so they will quickly find a compromise. The second seeming problem is that this type of syndic syndicalism, that farms go to the farmers, uh, factories go to the workers, uh, has a problem that workers in capital-intensive industries uh, would get more in terms of uh, shares or uh, wealth than workers in labor-intensive industries. There would be an unequal distribution result. On the other hand, um, an unequal, unequal distribution of income and wealth would also be the result 
if we would start, let's say, from scratch and people started homesteading things that had not been uh, owned by anybody at all, and the syndicalist idea of uh, uh, of giving the things to the giving the farms to the farmers is basically uh, the same principle as the homesteading principle, given the fact that these resources have been prior to the time uh, socially owned. Uh, apart from uh, from reprivatizing the entire country. Uh, all wage and price control should, of course, be abolished. Uh, complete freedom of occupation, trade, and movement should be introduced. And private property law should become the basic constitution of the country. That means, essentially, that everybody can do whatever he wants with his private property, once we have it reprivatized, as long as they do not physically damage the property owned by anybody else. And apart from that, no other legal restrictions or no other laws are required at all. The result of this would be, first of all, East German individuals would be from the outset amazingly wealthy, because the whole country would be private. There would be no government sector whatsoever. And we would have the rich West Germans as potential buyers. The privatization would also provide an immediate stimulus for future production. Shortages would disappear immediately because of the abolishing of price controls. Output would increase immediately too. Uh, the temporary high unemployment, recall that the West in the the Erhard reforms for one for less than half a year unemployment rose and then it started to decline. There would be temporary high unemployment, but that would quickly disappear with flexible wage rates and without taxation, everything is private, without taxation and flexible wage rates, capital imports will drastically increase. Uh, as a matter of fact, there will be quickly a brain and brain drain and entrepreneurial drain from West Germany to East Germany in a situation where there are no taxes, no regulations, and so on in East Germany. Uh, there will be reverse emigration. Uh, the DDR, the East German, uh, East German, uh, uh, East German territory could, territory could quickly become. Uh, one of the most quickly developing countries and, uh, and the emigration going uh, from west to east would then ultimately also force the West German government to privatize its highly socialized economy in turn, that is to de-welfareize West Germany. Now I'm of course aware of the fact that this might not be a, a very realistic proposal. Realistic in the sense that this is not likely to happen. Nonetheless, this sort of proposal can be put in effect. There could be no doubt that it is quick, can be quickly put into effect and it would work immediately. But in any case, even if this course of event is not being adopted, it seems to be of utmost importance to be clear about the general principles that must, must be applied in the East German case in order to, uh, in order to prevent uh, the course that is taking place presently from, uh, from happening and to, uh, to have some clear-cut ideas in what directions uh, the West German public should push uh, the, the West German government that is trying to just simply incorporate East, East German. Thank you very much.